Hi, everyone. My name is Ofer Naaman. Uh, I'm a research scientist at Google Quantum AI. Uh, today, I will be here representing our uh, chip architecture and fabrication team. And I will tell you about the work that they've uh, been doing uh, on improving yield and performance of our quantum processors uh, and readout systems. So even uh, a, a modest increase in scale from going from like the 54 uh, qubit devices that we, we ran for our Beyond Classical experiment to the 72 qubit devices that uh, you heard about today. Um, this uh, increase can, can, can mean all the difference between uh, um, high success rate of uh, working devices uh, and on the other hand, uh, um, unacceptably low uh, yields. Uh, the reason is that there's uh, more components, and all these components have to work and work well as designed. Um, the larger form factor of, of the larger chips also mean that we're going to have um, new problems, uh, new failure modes that are associated with the mechanical assembly. And just statistically speaking, uh, we're going we're gonna to see uh, um, we're going to sample more uh, rare failure modes that maybe we have been lucky to miss on a smaller scale uh, processors. Um, overall, the performance requirements for the for the surface code experiment uh, are are tighter, um, and so all these components have so so. When we increase the number of components, we increase the scale of the system. We also in, have to 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 worry about increasing the performance at the same time. Okay, so um, every chip that that is leaving the fab um, is going to have uh, going to go through uh, optical inspection and uh, electrical test at room temperature before it's cooled down. Um, the chips then are, are, are going to go into the fridge and cool down even chips that with, with, with known failures. And as we, when we cool it down and we, bring, uh, we subject them to the standard qubit bring up, uh, we're going to uh, record any new failures that we observe, for example, uh, qubits or couplers that can be biased, resonators with uh, low internal Q, or qubits that ended up with uh, frequencies out of spec. Uh, we will record and catalog um, all these failures, uh, and then when the chip is uh, post cool down, when the chip is back uh, at room temperature, we will take the chip and we'll do uh, further optical inspection and electrical test, and also we will do destructive um, uh, dye shearing and uh, further SEM, and this allows us to um, to uh, understand the failure mechanisms that are respons responsible for those uh, failures modes that we saw. So here's a, in this chart, there's an example of, of uh, a subset of the devices that we have analyzed, um, over, uh, tracked over time. Uh, and um, what you see is the, the um, plotted is the frequency of, of failures by failure mechanisms. Um, so we, with the chart like this, we can, we can look at, um, uh, we can rank the, the failures based on, uh, you know, and prioritize them. And then uh, we can go and root cause and mitigate those failures based on that priority order. Uh, so for example, we, uh, if we're looking here at around device five, uh, we uh, noticed an increased problem with uh, particle contamination and we went and solved that. Uh, and around device nine, for example, um, ESD um, related failure became the dominant mechanism and the uh, high priority mechanism. So we went and uh, improved that. Um, okay, so so just to show a sample of, of the uh, mitigation uh, that we implemented. So with ESD, uh, these are catastrophic failures, but, but they're rather rare. Um, so we started to implement uh, ESD safe handling practices and also implemented uh, ionization and humidity control and monitoring. Uh, this allows us to solve most of the ESD uh, problems. Uh, dealing with scratches, we had to retool our um, wafer and die handling with, with custom tweezers, vacuum wands, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and it, uh, with respect to particles, 
Um, we added uh, steps for in, for inspection, uh, and then also added uh, additional die cleaning procedures and air filtering. Okay, so so aside from uh, from just component yield, we can, we also have to worry about uh, parametric yield. So this means that parameters are um, you know has has some distribution around the the values where they were designed. Um, one of ex one example is the anomonicity of a qubits, where you can see that we have uh, about ten percent spread in that parameter. Uh, we trace that uh, spread in this parameter to variations in our flip chip uh, gap between the, the qubit chip and the wiring chip. This is a critical dimension for all coupling, uh, capacitive coupling uh, through, through the vacuum. Um, this, um, this wafer map showed the, the distribution of chip gap uh, away from the mean uh, before we implemented the fix and after we implemented the fix for this. And as you can see, the, in response to that fix, the anharmonicity of the qubit uh, or across the processor became a lot tighter. Um, and, and um, you know, OK. So one of the key uh, points that I want to make about this is that uh, when we build bigger processors, we also have to build more processors. This allows us to get more data. Um, and really find catalog uh, root cause and correct uh, failure modes and improve yield. Uh, we also have to iterate on experiments, uh, both at room temperature and cryo, to get all that data. Um, so the, the higher data volume really benefited from a lot of work that was done here on the team to uh, really streamline the, the qubit bring up procedures, uh, as well as creating infrastructure for databasing and mining. Uh, looking forward uh, and to continue improving our, our processes, um, yield, and, and our iteration rate, uh, we're moving uh, or migrating our fabrication into a new uh, 10,000 square feet clean room space. Um, this will have uh, dedicated tools. Uh, over 25 tools are already installed and being brought up. Uh, and this really allows us, will allow us to, to, to iterate as fast as we want and really control the processes to, to improve the yield. Okay, so I want to move on now to improving the, the performance of our, um, of, our circuit, uh, of our circuits, especially in the context of uh, error correction. Uh, the figure here shows an error budget that we presented in one of our papers from uh, 2021. And I want to draw your attention to the blue uh, bar here, which represent the uh, errors that are accrued by the data qubits while the measure qubits are being uh, uh, read out and reset. Uh, as you can see, this, this, uh, this, this accounts for a large chunk of our, uh, of our error in the system. Uh, so the way to deal with it is we have to either uh, improve T1 so that, or, or the coherence of the qubit so that they don't uh, decohere while we're doing the uh, measurement and reset, or, uh, or in addition, reduce the overall total time that it requires to read out and reset our qubits. So let's talk about T1s. Um, our T1s have been um, uh, low with compared to the state of the art. Uh, and one of the questions that we want to answer is that, can our process even support high T1s? Uh, are we doing something wrong? So what we did to address this, we did an experiment where we have done uh, multiple uh, design splits with much simpler qubit designs, uh, meaning that we are really not trying to integrate, uh, not trying to design the circuit to, to integrate a lot of qubits, but just to get the best um, qubits following the best design practices. Um, we have processed these chips uh, using the same materials, the same tools, and the same process, and subjected the, the, the chips to much of the same processing as our flagship devices. Uh, what we can see is that, um, indeed, we can get uh, up to uh, 80 microsecond or so um, uh, coherence times. 
uh, or T1 times. Uh, and this, what, what this tells us is that um, our processes are not fundamentally limiting our T1 at this point. And rather, the, the lower T1s that we, that we observe are limited by design choices that prioritize uh, integration and scalability over coherence at, that, at this point. Even with our current processes, uh, with the current processor, with the current designs, we can still get improvement in T1. Uh, for example, we implemented the uh, silicon trenching process. Um, and this allows us to reduce some of the participation uh, of um, surface, um, surface losses in our, in our qubits. Uh, and we can see that we can get um, up to 30% improvement in T1 across, uh, or in average across our processors. Okay, the other thing I want to talk about is reducing readout and reset time. Um, and really here, the, the parameter that controls that time is uh, kappa. Um, this is basically the coupling rate between the readout resonators and the 50 ohm environment. And it really determines the, the resonator ring up and ring down time uh, and limits the, the rate at which we can uh, read out and reset. Uh, so in quantum error correction, uh, where all the measure qubits have to be read out and reset at every cycle along the, the error correction uh, algorithm. The, the error correction cycle can only proceed as fast as the slowest uh, readout and reset. So, um, or, so, so that's why um, getting the spread of, um, of that time, um, characteristic time uh, is important. Uh, this is this is a, a chart from one of our processors. Uh, what it shows is the characteristic time, uh, one over kappa in nanosecond versus resonator frequency. And we see two things. Uh, first of all, we see that there's there's uh, at least a factor of two variation um, across the chip in that parameter. Um, and we see two trends. One trend is um, this overall trend. Uh, we understand that as alignment or, or rather misalignment between uh, our frequency, uh, resonant frequency, uh, re readout resonator frequency band and the frequency of our Purcell filter. Uh, the other thing that we observe is a large variation in kappa or one over kappa uh, between resonators that are nominally at the same frequency. We understand that effect is coming from impedance mismatches uh, on the different readout lines. Um, that are used uh, on the different readout channels. Uh, the impedance mismatches um, can create standing waves, which is another way of saying that for each readout line, the um, environment appears as slightly different impedance. And that's what uh, leading to that spread. So we modeled and simulated that those effects uh, and, and how they uh, affect uh, system performance. Um, once we understood that this is the root cause, we went and characterized all our, uh, the relevant microwave components uh, in our radar chain, uh, looking specifically at reflection and, and return loss. Uh, we picked uh, uh, components that, um, that are, uh, have low return loss and integrated them back into the system. And what you can see from this chart is that indeed we were able to, um, to reduce the spread uh, of kappa quite significantly, and uh, this will lead to, uh, or this led to uh, faster overall readout uh, and, and, and in result, lower uh, data qubit idle errors. All right, so finally, uh, I wanna look forward at how we may scale our readout assembly. Um, you all seen pictures like this one. Uh, this shows the bottom of our fridge. And uh, in most of these pictures, what you will see is that the, the uh, components associated with the reader chain uh, are taking significant uh, footprint or significant space um, uh, in the fridge. Uh, to be able to scale the system further, uh, we will need to do two things. One is we want to increase our uh, readout multiplexing, meaning we can read more qubits with, this, with, with, um, uh, with the same uh, number of, of readout devices. 
Um, this, in return, um, requires that our parametric amplifiers uh, have higher dynamic range, so we can read more, we can add more qubit tones, uh, more readout tones on the same amplifier. And we want to also be able to engineer uh, the param bandwidth and, and gain profile to support the, the, the increased integration. The other way to, uh, to sort of mitigate this, this problem is to uh, start miniaturizing circulators uh, and maybe um, going beyond what can be done uh, in terms of, of size and, and, and weight and footprint uh, from what you can get with uh, ferro devices. So uh, our team uh, developed high dynamic range parametric amplifiers. These are based on our, uh, uh, basically on, on our workhorse uh, impedance matched amplifiers. Um, what we have done is replace the, the standard DC squid that, that, is the, um, that is the active element in these devices with an array of, of our squids where each of the squids have a higher critical current uh, junction. Uh, this data shows uh, that uh, we can get across a whole processor um, amplifiers with, that perform with, with uh, about 20 dB gain, uh, more or less, around the, 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 the whole frequency range that is relevant for readout. Um, we also shown uh, here that our, these amplifiers can get over 20 dB uh, improvement uh, over state of the art in saturation power. So there's a factor of 100. Um, and we also done experiments to verify that there's no adverse effect uh, from using these new amplifiers compared to the standard amplifiers, both on coherence, qubit coherence. So this shows uh, CPMG data and in readout efficiency. Uh, comparing the new amplifiers in blue to the to the standard amplifiers in red. So another approach uh, is to engineer the param gain and bandwidth, um, and and our team has been working on that. Uh, the design approach for these new amplifiers is uh, based on a paper that we published recently uh, in collaboration with NIST. Uh, following this design approach, we uh, we are able to show that. Um, we can match uh, uh, the parametric amplifiers with, with, or properly match amplifiers with, with an on-chip filter network. This allows us to get uh, amplifiers that are, have rather flat gain uh, of about 20 dB or more uh, over 500 megahertz uh, frequency band. Using a similar de design approach, uh, uh, Randy, he was, um, um, uh, Google research intern uh, last summer uh, designed um, uh, Johnson parametric circulators. Um, they are shown here. These are the simulations. Uh, you can see from the simulations that um, as designed, those um, circulators can support um, about 250 megahertz of bandwidth, uh, providing 20 dB isolation over that bandwidth and also offer a high dynamic range. Uh, so we are we are excited to have Randy uh, come back uh, this fall and and measure those devices. Okay, so to summarize, uh, being in, uh, building bigger processors means improving components, uh, component and parametric yields, uh, and we do that by tracking uh, and mitigating failures, understanding and controlling parameter spreads, and ultimately migrating our processes into a new fab facility. Um, this goes hand in hand with improving algorithmic, algorithmic performance uh, via process and design work. Um, looking into the future, scaling our systems will require uh, more innovation, uh, really in all subsystems involved. Uh, and I've shared new examples of new devices on the readout front that can uh, start carrying us toward that uh, direction. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. <music>